COP27 continues in Egypt. Leaders, stakeholders and environment enthusiasts are all engaged in coming up with policies that will determine the future of our world. As the curtains in Egypt slowly close, what is the position of the young people? What role do they have to play in making this world better? I'll be having this conversation with Jonathan Odongo, founder of Kenya Environment Education Network, and Marete Selvin, environmentalist and filmmaker. Let's just have a look at some of the work they are doing. In Kenya's Masai Mara, one man is fighting for an animal that is often hated and feared, the vulture. Thought by many to be an ugly, bloody scavenger that feeds on the dead. Yet, despite its bad rap, the vulture is one of the planet's most important species. Vultures have this unique ability to digest toxic bacteria by consuming rotting carcass. These birds clean up the landscape, preventing the spread of diseases like anthrax and rabies. Vultures save lives. But in just 50 years, the vulture has been pushed to near extinction, mainly by poison. Depending on how they respond to treatment of the poison, until when the vet say it's fit to go back to the wild. Just by some of the communication out there, selling, sending the message home on what we need to do to protect our biodiversity, the places we call home, Karibuni Sana. When we talk about um, what we've just seen there, where do we stand as young people in selling and sending the message that this is our time to stand and protect the place we call home? I think... Um it doesn't have to be us taking a stand. It's us realizing that if we do not do something today, then probably in our lifetime, we'd have lost some of this biodiversity that is very key to us for our own survival and also for our survival of our kids. If you go back to culturally, maybe like Kikuyu, they say that uh, land you've been, this land is rented to you by your children. So we're not doing this for ourselves. We have to do it for our children. So we have to see this not as a problem of today, but a problem that will be experienced by our generation, which is already experiencing it, and also the generation to come. And it will be worse for them. It's like, if it's like this for us now, imagine the next generation and the other one and the other one, it will be worse for them. So we have to do it today, not because we're young people, but because it's important for us to do it. And so when you sit down and decide to channel this communication to the entire globe, what is running through your mind? What pushes you to be that champion standing out there ensuring that this biodiversity, the place we call home, is protected? You know, what, what's happening, I, I concur with my, my counterpart, uh, Selvin. What's happening is that we are the generation that has realized that uh, there is something at stake. Um, our, our biodiversity and we are linking this back to uh, our continent uh, of Africa we have 30 percent of the world's biodiversity and there is something our ancestors our forefathers did and that is why we are where we are today so we are asking ourselves the question what happened in between and uh, what happened in between is likely to jeopardize the future of uh, my children and my grandchildren so that is what runs through our minds as the young people. How can we ensure that they also enjoy what our ancestors enjoyed and what we found so that these things do not disappear? And that is why we're using avenues such as the films you've seen 
to get the information out there. And I hear the situation where this is the 27th COP. The first COP was in 1992, if I'm not wrong. This is the 27th attempt. And as young people, we realize that we have more time to live in this world. Exactly. Do you think that COP has captured the voice of the youth when it comes to protecting this world? Absolutely. Um, I want to, s to put that question into yes and no. Mm -hmm. uh, no, because we haven't really seen the implementation of what has been decided year after year. And secondly, also, there are some young voices that are being heard. But then what? After they're heard and they've said this is what is happening on the ground, what are the actions that are following after they made all these decisions? And that's the key, the most important thing. It's important for the world leaders to meet and have these discussions and decide what it is that they are going to do. But it's more important to implement what it is that they are saying. And also for us who are not in the COP and who are on the ground also to decide that, it is not just for them to decide what is going to happen. It is also for us to decide how we're going, what part we have to play and how we're going to do it and implement some of these things that we'd want to see happening. It's not, it's not just their job, it is our job collectively. And when you talk about what needs to, to happen, President William Ruto is big on forest cover. He says that he wants <coughs> 5 billion trees to be planted in this country, 30% of forest cover to be achieved. And he's going to use the young people. As the young people, how are we taking this information as we should? Or are we just there to be told, Kaziako and Kupandamit? So we, we have uh, the young people, this is a very active part of the population. And if you look at what has been happening recently, right now if you organize a tree planting event, who will show up? The highest number of youths. And what I've seen from the even events we've organized is that the youths want to do these things. It's like we want change right away. Uh, so any, anything, for example, just like you rightly said, the president said by 2032, we want our forest cover to be over 30%. And there is that ambitious plan to plant 15, uh, is it billion trees by 2032. Uh, this is ambitious but achievable mm -hmm. because if you look at our population and the number of the young people interested in getting this done, we are passionate about these things, these issues. So if the president calls upon us today, just like he has, we will immediately jump to action. And, and we also have platforms like the social media, the youth are very active. And uh, the information will spread so fast, and we just need that fire. So if we have a president who is already passionate about this and uh, wa is working towards this, then the youth, I'm telling you, is, uh, we are ready to jump on board. We are ready to jump on that and save this world. But exactly. where do we belong? Where is our chair on that table where decisions are being made? Where do we belong? Because every other day, decisions are made, but our voice are not heard. How do we go about it? Uh, we stop waiting. <laughs> because we've been waiting to be given spaces in these tables, and no one is doing that. So we have to take them. And we take them in small ways and in big ways. We already have environmental activists who are doing a fantastic job. And we, we do it in a small way in whatever areas that we are in. Because we also have to realize that climate change is not just affecting the biodiversity and the environment. It's actually linked to everything that we need for survival. It's our health, it's the water we drink, it's, it's on our transportation, it's in the air that we breathe. So it's literally touching every single thing that we need to survive. So we can no longer continue waiting to be given these spaces. No, we have to take them and start doing something from where we are. We, it doesn't have to be big. It can be small. It could be planting trees and taking care of them, nurturing them until they're fully grown. It could be telling stories mm. where we come in, because that's where our skills are. It could be something else. And when this is put together, then it becomes collective, collective action and something happens in the end. And just, just, just to add on to that, uh, if you look at the climate change conference going on right now, my feeling is the, the convention, the UNFCCC, uh, the youth have been uh, fighting for a, uh, a seat on the table. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a, a smaller table that has pulled uh, near the bigger table for the youth. So there is a youth constituency at the UNFCCC. So we go to the conference, uh, you will see the youths organizing matches and, and demonstrations for things to be done. But then I think uh, this has been done uh, for the youth as a formality. So uh, I, just like uh, my uh, counterpart has said, I think what we need to do is instead of 
uh, agreeing to be on that smaller table, we need to jump to the bigger table and make sure that we drive the action. And if possible, we tell this generation, this is the 27th year this is happening. And for 27 years, if there is no meaningful action to show, then it means we need to tell these people to now create space for the young people who are driven to see the change and the action to actually now. Yet you realize that in this country, we still have communities, we still have people who depend on firewood. And firewood means trees being cut. So then how do we as young people come together talked with uh, our locals, like our people back home, back at the grassroots levels, and explained to them that cutting a tree has A, B, C, D effects, but in the same, same uh, breath, have these conversations with powers that be so that we have an alternative for them, because you can't get them out of fire with, with an alternative. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you uh, a, a, sh a short story. I was working with a, a, a youth group uh, a group of students actually. So we were talking about there is World Day to combat desertification. So uh, we were working on public speaking and uh, one of them uh, gave a speech on how we need to move from fuel wood uh, into uh, clean energy. And then after that passionate speech about let's, do that, let's, let's embrace biogas and everything, she came to the side and told me, you know what, I come from Masabit County, in one of the remote areas of Masabit County. And Truth be told, these things to do with the LPG, the gas, the biogas and stuff, what we are, <laughs> the only thing we can see is that fuel wood, the charcoal and firewood. So what can we do to, as a community to make sure that we are not relying on firewood mm -hmm. and charcoal? And that's when I knew that beyond education and awareness creation and telling stories, we also need to work with the powers that be, as you, as you mm -hmm. said, to make sure that there is socio-economic transformation, empowerment of the community, so that we are able to embrace these other sources of energy that are cleaner. So that now we don't have people with excuses that we know, you know what, we do not have any alternative whatsoever. So then we realized that our work as environmentalists also go beyond just talking about the environment, but talking about how we can transform life. And Selvin, uh, before we came here, we were talking about how all these meetings are glamorous, right? Yeah. How do we ensure that these meetings stop appearing as though they're just a PR exercise? We need actions now, because remember, the conversation on loss and damage was pushed to 2024. Yet, as we speak right now in this country, there is a family that is not able to put food on the table. There is a family that had to sell their cow at a hundred bob. How do we then demand that change must happen now? I think there is a lot of unlearning and being deliberate and intentional about how we tackle climate change and come to the point where we are we're now talking about climate adaptation. And I think the first thing would be to start looking within. For a very long time we've looked without for solutions, forgetting that we are a people who are innovative and creative in coming up with our own solutions and just because you're looking without doesn't mean something isn't happening within these communities that we think they're suffering and they do not understand what is really happening they do understand and they do know what is ailing them and they are already doing something so if you're coming in as an expert if you're coming in as an NGO if you're coming in as a government can you sit down with these people can you see what it is that they are doing already is it scalable can you just build on to their capacity? Can you facilitate and make it more scalable where they can also, so that it becomes their own. And when we start owning our own solutions, which are already there, then we'll be able to deal with this challenge that is really humongous and it's with us today. So we have to really rethink, relearn, and be deliberate and intentional. And so, um, as we move forward in a, in a few minutes, um, there is the aspect of partnering with bodies that are championing this in your interwebs, in your meetings with NGOs, AWF, WWF. What, what, what are they saying? How do we ensure that this message gets home? So there is, uh, uh, through, for example, the, uh, the stories we worked on, and, and this is where entities come in. Um, African Wildlife Foundation, for example, uh, realized that there is power in storytelling. Mm -hmm. And those of us who've been uh, working as, a, as an educator, 
I've been trying to create educational content just to reach out to a smaller audience. But then uh, through African Conservation Voices platform, um, an opportunity to invite us on board to be able to now tell these stories in a manner that will be able to make an impact, uh, to tell quality stories, to reach out to you know the masses in a in a way that we can say now this story will make an impact. That is where organizations can can come. Well, that is one of the areas where organizations can come on board. But also, like I, I mentioned, the challenges that are hindering. For example, we talk about poverty as a hindrance to environmental mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. So, how can we have entities on board? that will now be able to address the poverty. We close this gap so that now, like I said before, we don't have any excuse that, you know, we have to over rely on natural resources because we have no means whatsoever. And this is where now we try to also uh, call on, you know, for example, the county governments. I'd like to add something about our NDC, Nationally Determ Determined Contribution. If you look at that document, we are talking about realizing uh, climate action mitigation and adaptation. But the budget is 62 billion US dollars. That is about 6.2 trillion. Yeah, yeah. We are saying in that document that 13% will be funded by the, uh, the, the national government, Kenya. But then 87% will be donor funding. So you see, we've left our environment to donor funding. Yet, one thing we need to do mm -hmm. is to look inwards as a country, as Africa, what do we need to do without expecting support from other sources? Other sources. Yeah. So as a country, we know that we are dedicating these resources to address these challenges so that we realize these goals, climate action, so that we don't suffer from it. And uh, it is on that note that we say, as the youth, we need to come together. Thank you very much. That's the time we had. A lot to be said, unfortunately. Masa. And we continue to urge everybody to come together as we continue to champion this message forward. This world is where we call home, making it green, making it safer for us and our children and the generations to come. It's our responsibility. My name is Dennis Asseto. This is Planet Action. Tomorrow, we continue making this world green. Good evening.